Hello and welcome to the Double Your Freelancing podcast, where you'll learn how to raise your rates, get better clients, and just generally have a way better life as a freelancer or agency owner. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart, and today I'm here with Joanna Galvao from GIF Design Studios. I can never pronounce the A with the squiggly from Portuguese correctly. I don't know if I did that right. Sorry if you speak Portuguese and I did it wrong, but I think it's Joanna Galvao, something like that. From GIF Design Studios about finances and profitability as an agency owner, networking strategies, and uh, strategies for scaling a small, lean uh, agency. We're also going to talk a bit about her experiences running an agency, which she's successfully removed herself from and was able to actually step away from for maternity leave, which is really cool. Her experience is running an agency versus uh, running a product-based business because she also has a course and coaching business. Uh, and this interview came from within the Double Your Freelancing community as an expert interview, uh, which also doubled as part of this work in progress course called Start the Right Type of Business. So if you hear me referencing that kind of stuff today, now you'll understand why. If you want to check out the community for yourself, uh, it includes one-on-one -on -one live video coaching with me every week, along with weekly uh, masterminds and goal check-ins and a big repository of past coaching sessions. And then when we have expert interviews like this, community members get to attend live and actually ask our experts live Q&A on the call, which is pretty cool. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to dyf.link forward slash dyfa. And for any of the show notes, you can go to dyf.link forward slash episode 89. And that's the number 89, lowercase, one word. We'll have all of the links for Joanna's stuff there, transcript, chat GPT highlights, that kind of thing. Uh, and if last call to action, if you want to check out that uh, beta course for yourself, it's within our DYF University membership, which is at dyf.link forward slash university. So let's jump into the interview. So Joanna, I'm just going to read off her bio here. She's the co-founder of the award-winning design agency GIF Design Studios, and she's a leading business coach for ambitious creatives who want to take the shortcut. She's based in Porto, Portugal, which, fun fact, we actually met up in person in Porto only one time in my whole like three months that I was there. <laughs> and her agency specializes in brand identities and conversion-obsessed design and serves industry leaders in 17 countries on five continents. Her coaching program, Ambitious Creatives Book Solid, helps freelancers get booked solid with dream projects to six figures and beyond without burnout. And she speaks internationally on entrepreneurship and the power of design and creativity. And her work has been featured in The Guardian UK, Brand Brilliance, and Digital Arts Magazine. She's here today to talk to us about a lot of things, really. Uh, I really want to pick her brain about networking. And we will also use this for the uh, Start the Right Type of Business course because of her experience running this kind of like lean bespoke agency. And I know that's what Thomas and Bruce are both looking forward to as well. But the secret sauce that I want to get from you, Joanna, especially is that networking stuff. So it's going to be like a dual purpose interview. Uh, so hello. Welcome. Hi, Zach. So good to talk to you. And thank you, you for as having well. Me. Sure. So um, for this interview, for those of you who haven't come to the series yet, basically the core challenge in the community that the like start the right type of business series helps to address is kind of like the the starting an agency but not sure how big you want to scale it. I hear a lot of people say that they want to start just a small agency, but then in my personal experience running like a small agency kind of sucks because you have to be the project manager and the salesperson and all of the other little glue positions because you can't afford to hire all that out. Whereas if you had a big agency, you could. And I know your agency is relatively small, though I don't know how big it is now. I think it's a bit bigger now. So I want to basically dive into that, have you compare the product-based business with the agency business, and um, and as I said, do the networking stuff. So from the networking perspective, the kind of core question that I have here from Patricia is like, it would be great to know how to approach people without the celebrity fan dynamic, uh, without being too salesy, but also kind of like selling yourself. 
in that short conversation that you're having with somebody at a conference or something. And I, you and I were chatting the other day about uh, what you did with Matthew Kimberly. You said like, find the space where we are equals. And I thought that was a really cool hook that I, for those of you here listening, I told her, stop, save this for the real interview because this is great. So I'll be interested to dig into that with you. So um, I guess just to start, let's just get some basic info about your business. So mm -hmm. what is the the current state of your agency? Like how much revenue do you do? How many team members do you have? What are your operating costs? All that stuff. Oh, you really want everything. I mean, you can give me a higher level if you want, but I just kind of <laughs> want to know what your current quote end state is of your agency right now. Um, okay, so last year, I think we're looking at around 600,000 revenue for the year with seven full-time staff and our operation or average monthly costs was i think 20k okay i actually have the numbers here so our average monthly was 40,000 euros average expense 32,000 so average income 40 average expense 32 Mm -hmm. So you essentially put essentially six figures in your pocket a year. Yes. Okay. Now we do. Yeah. Also yeah. inspired by our conversation, Zach. So very yeah. thankful for that. <laughs> so I don't even like you keep telling me I like made such an impact, but I barely remember what I even said. So the one time Joanna and I met up in Porto, I apparently said some cool, helpful stuff. What did I even say? Something about you money. Know what? I'm sure. I don't. You know how like it's like it's not the person doesn't remember what you told them they remember how you made them feel how did i make you and, feel <laughs> um i think first of all i remember feeling like oh zach understands like my anxiety around money and why this is so hard he empathizes and apparently i'm not and you, you made me feel like i'm not alone and like this is something that everyone faces really and then um, you also made me feel hopeful because I feel like you were a couple of steps ahead of me in your financial education at mm. the time. And you seem to, since feeling how I was feeling in that moment till when we had the conversation, you seem to feel a lot more peace around money and how you managed your finances and everything. So you made me feel hopeful that mm. there was a, a right way. Uh, there was a there was a better way to do things yeah and and then you told me a bunch of resources i I can't remember what they were, but I remember at the time I checked them out and <laughs> started to learn about them and prioritized uh profit uh but it was really like this idea of i mean to anyone who has heard Zach interview before and he, it must be similar to how you um, converse with people. You you ask really deep and meaningful and thoughtful questions. And I think you did uh -huh. that in our conversation and made me really feel think about, well, what do I want mm. out of life? And in 50 years from now, like if I was planning my retirement, what does that look like? What is mm. that? What do I need to live on? And when I started to answer those questions, I realized that... Um, well, I definitely want peace of mind. I don't want to be in this constant chasing the money to pay the bills month on month. And so for that, I need more profit and a big cushion for the team. And then I realized that I didn't need all that much for the lifestyle that I envision living with growing a family. I, I needed to buy my own house, um, which we have my husband and I, and I needed to, I wanted to be able to afford private schooling for my kids and travel maybe twice a year with them. Um, and so when I did the math, yeah, we're now working up towards what that looks like on paper. And cool. yeah, we really focused on building our savings. And for those listening, which if you want me to cut it from the recording, tell me, but for those listening, when her and I chatted in Porto, it must've been, when was I trying to move to Porto? I guess like 20, 18 or 2019 or something yeah. it's been a few years uh and i think when we were chatting then you were like freaking out struggling like not worried worried if you'd make the bills and now joanna has like i think you said like 200k just 
in cash saved uh, as a cushion for the business or whatever. And like, that's so freaking cool. So proud of you for that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And especially well, when we look. Too. Can I say that? <laughs> I think, I think it would, I, I don't know if like, you said it, but you should. Like, I try and inspire everybody to, to do the same. Because I remember when, when I first heard somebody say, I have 100K in the bank and I'm thinking like, you're not even 30. How do you, how's that possible? Um, that became like a milestone. And really, they say money can't buy happiness, but it buys me peace of mind and better yeah. sleep. That's for sure. And I know in that uh, interview you linked me to that you did with Chris Doe, is that his name? The Future? Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned profit first in that interview. And this is tangential. So guys, if you're bored by this, you can comment. But uh, on your route to going from where you were to where you are now in a, in a more financially secure place, like what were the things that were influential? Was it profit first? Was it just this insight to like trying to be more profitable and cutting where it's not needed? Like what, what made the difference between... Cause when you and I first were chatting, like you were doing like 25, 30 K a month, you were, you were doing great gross revenue. You just weren't profiting. Like what was, what changed, what influenced you on this route to profitability? Um, I think a lot of things influenced me. Um, profit first was, was a big one, but at the end of the day, what worked, like what actionable takeaways can people do to like mimic what we did? Just look at the books every month, every week. Mm. They it's say so what simple. gets measured gets managed. Ugh, it's so simple. And I was just, just avoiding it. Mm. Um, and like to really look at it, like really understand your numbers and where they're going and reflect and iterate week upon week. Um, when we first um, did a profit first assessment, we realized we were an agency operating on like 10% profit, some months mm. less than that. And so the first thing we had to look, do is have a good hard look on our expenses. You know, just because we had the cash does, didn't mean we should spend it. Mm. And I wasn't managing it very well. I was um, spending a lot of it on events, which I, I believe it's thanks to events that the agency got to wear um we are and it's thanks to events that i know you zach but you know i didn't need to fly business mm, i didn't need to sure is nice in it stay in nice hotels um i wasn't staying in ridiculous hotels but i could have just done more airbnb -ing, like i used to at the right. beginning when cash was <laughs> very uh what not as abundant and and uh, I was spending a lot on education and coaching and and then at the end of the day we realized that also for the revenue we were bringing in we needed to we needed to increase our prices that was gonna take some time because you can't just it's not easy to just magically double your prices and stay booked the same um and then we realized we also needed to cut staff that was really hard to do mm. And so with your current profitability, so you said that right now your income is 40K with 32K of expenses. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. That was our average and, last year. And as I recall, Portugal charges you out the ass in taxes, like 40%. So is that 32K including your anticipated taxes or is the tax going to be on top of that? No. So on the profit, we will get taxed 28%. On the 8K a month, you'll get tax 8%, 28%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the your 40K is more like uh, the 40% is more on um, staffing costs. Mm, okay. It's personal tax. Okay. Per not personal, sorry. <laughs> you know, I say I, I'm more financial li literate than when we, when we first chatted, but um, I have a lot to <laughs> study still. But, but I assume that. So, the 40 if you is make on 100k what you yeah um a year in salary portugal or the government will take 40 percent. yeah but in the business it'll take 20. cool okay that's good to know so given that the whole purpose of this like i have this flow chart thingy i can pull up for the start the right type of business course but the whole purpose of this course is to help people connect with what kind of business they want to run 
And so given that you take home 100K a year, roughly, like that's a nice solid number. Most people are pretty happy with, with a low six-figure income. I'm kind of curious, like... Uh, oh, but the, I pay myself, my husband and I, we also get a salary out of the business. Oh, okay, cool. So, so this 100K so in profit is in not... The, that's why this money in, is in the bank, because we don't need it. Oh, okay. So then let's clarify. So you're paying yourself a salary of whatever. You can say it if you want. You don't have to say it if you don't want to. And then the business is doing 100K in profit that is like could be reinvested into growth or it's just a cushion or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So right okay. now it's just sitting there and you told me I need to do something about it. <laughs> but you had a very good rebuttal, which is that you don't have the energy to do that. And I agreed with you. I don't have the energy right now yet to learn yeah. how to. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So that paints kind of a good picture. So let's let's talk about how you got here. So um, I want to later in the interview compare like so are you comfortable sharing what you pay yourself as a salary? Yeah, but you know what? I'll also admit that it's not fixed. Okay. Um, if there are like, for example, I know that I'm in September, I'm going to want to pay my um, son's school for the year in bulk because you save money that way. And so I'll just take that out of the okay. business. But I mean, you can tell me your average um, annual salary. But it will be around three and a half K. So 7K for both of us. Per month? Okay. So like a little bit under 100 grand a year. It's so like 80-ish grand a year. So here's the we question. We don't have a mortgage. We paid the house in cash. Like there's all these. Yeah. And I'm, we're, I'm not doing yeah. this to paint your like big baller lifestyle. I'm doing it for the following question, which is if you're paying yourself 70-ish, 80-ish grand a year, and you're comparing making 80 grand a year, let's say, from running this agency to 80 grand a year with your product-based business to 80 grand a year as like a solo freelancer designer. I'll be really interested to hear where what, what your preferences are, what you think the pros and cons are of the different routes compared to each other. Um, so have that spinning in your mind, but I want to hear your... Oh, actually, you're about to say something. So you can say something if you want, but I'll, I was going to ask you your backstory first. Well... Let's say it. Oh, you you want to do the backstory first? You were about to answer. Let's let's tap into the creative, off the cuff answer. Um, if I, because it's eighty grand. Is that the math of how much I pay myself a year? Uh, well, seven times twelve. Let's see. Yeah, Eighty four so thousand a year. The profit, right, that we have. So it's almost like one hundred and eighty. I'm like, for the work I do at the agency, I'm like, that's the dream. Um, I would do this, I would choose this path all over again. My problem is that I don't know how to have free time. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't like, unfortunately for me, I don't like life the easy way and I am ambitious and I started this other business. So I think if, I don't know, now just having, running the agency sounds really appealing or just running the product business. It's just the both of them that feels a little bit overwhelming. But yeah. it, it it's really appealing um because I, you know, if I, I I would imagine that if I had gone down the um, freelancing route, um what was the third route? Product based business, agency, solo freelancer. Oh yeah. Product based business. So your ambitious creative <laughs> book funny, solid business. Like, I'm like, well, the agency, the agency is the dreamiest option of all mm. because um, it's the one that at the moment, after a decade of running it requires, if it's what comes easiest, mm. product-based business still all very um, new, and it's what requires the least of my time. Mm. I can probably go a week where I only need to do an hour of work a day for gift design studios to run well. Cool. Um, and so, and to be able to take that amount of money from the business, that's the dream. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's and, a sellable and, business now too, is the nice bit. You know, I, I think it still needs a lot of work to be sellable, but I, I could be wrong. Um, but you know, it's the business that gave me two maternity leaves without ha me having to check email. It's the business that gave me enough free time in my hands to then want to start another business. Um, but um, 
I've I've built it in a way that I could I have sometimes removed myself from sales, completely removed myself from project management, removed myself from creative direction, quality control. Like it's funny because I know I do a lot, but in conversations now I'm like, yeah, what do I do at the agency? Have you done your time uh, tracking exercise yet? Not yet. No. <sighs> I was nagging her about this last week, guys. Because last week was the week that I it was, the crazy was meant to take off, and then we had a couple of yeah. fires come up. So, oh, so you didn't get to do your res restoration holiday thing? No. Oh, that yeah, sucks. Hope we you had do that two soon. fires come up. My daughter almost got admitted into hospital as well, so there's that with Ooh, kids. That's great. She's, she's good now. Good. Um, so, no. so for the structure, can you remind me? So you said how many staff total? including you eight okay and what no, do these seven last year okay what uh how does the the role break down like who does what of these people you've got the so joanna for, for the agency yeah. it's seven um i'm ceo creative director uh my husband is a chief technical officer if we want to give a fancy title but he'll handle the development and the dev team that we sometimes subcontract um, we've got Joanna A, who's operations manager, and she wears a lot of hats. So she runs the, she's studio manager, also project manager. And then we've got our lead designer and a senior and two juniors, or mm. I guess one could be mid, considered mid-level now. And that's everyone. Yeah. Cool. And so in terms of the... I'm trying to think of your average project because I want to like paint this picture for the people listening. Like, uh, I think that you said your typical project is the brand identity, but also the website. But I'm kind of curious, like, how often are you doing tech stuff versus strictly design stuff? By tech, you mean development like website of stuff. websites? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I should have looked at my numbers before this, but I would say like, Every three projects, one will only be brand identity. The other ones will always come with design. But um, to give you an idea, in terms of hours, brand identity projects, we reserve 80 hours to do the brand identity. Websites, we reserve 200 hours for the design. And normally, they can be developed in 100 hours average. Um, no, actually, I would say 100 and 50 hours, 100 hours for design for the website. 200 is like a one with a lot of long sales pages. And we charge 30K for brand identity and website design. That's an average. If it's just brand identity, it's now 8,500. Okay. So 30K for something that takes 230 staff hours, yeah? Yeah. 130k per hour, or $130 an hour and you obviously pay less than that so yeah so there's some good baseline profitability um let me think of what other background things so right now your clients mostly are pretty much all coming from your network and from word of mouth and stuff right yes okay so we we'll chat have, more about we did yeah. we did um we always look at where they come from and slowly clients who find us from footers of websites that we've designed is increasing. I think last year it was uh, 11%, mm. which I think is like one client or two. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I get website footer clients. It's like one of those old vestiges of like, like why, who even decided it was okay to link back in the website footer? I don't know, but I sure appreciate it because I do indeed yeah. get clients that way. Yeah. It's like the uh, license plate thingy from a car dealership. Um, and how many clients do you reckon you work with a year? How many different clients? Um, so we only work with around 10 new clients a year. I've seen uh, that has been an average, which I remember the first time I saw these statistics, I was like, oh, is that it? Like I need <laughs> to gain less than one client a month. And then we have a lot of repeat clients and that's where it gets hard to like paint like a, a 
a simple picture because sometimes they they just need a couple of things here and there. Other times they do want a completely new website for this new venture, this new project that they're doing. Um, but I think it was 60% of last year was repeat clients and 40% okay. new ones. Cool. So something uh, to give some context to the audience, something that I think is interesting about Joanna is that she has her kind of like coaching product based business that she markets with like typical internet marketing -y style things. Um, but she doesn't do that for her agency. Like she doesn't do the blueprint style marketing. I the tried. Agency. To, for me, I couldn't make it work. <laughs> so that was what I was going to ask. So like you did that interview with the future, which got you hella views and stuff. Like how did you book that? And could you book that sort of thing for your agency? It's, it's funny because it's like everything comes down to the relationships and how you build relationships. I, f I find at least with everything that has happened in the tra trajectory of my agency and I can, I can reverse engineer, you know, how you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. I can reverse engineer everything down to replying to a tweet. <laughs> to Chris Ducker. That's how we know each other. That's how I mm -hmm. end up knowing getting on the future. It all like it all comes down to that. And um and so my approach to uh like like even even now before before this I always like to watch other interviews before an interview so I can like get inspired and I was reading, I was listening to Ali Abdal. He is a big YouTuber and he's talking about his coach. Um, and his coach, his business coach is used to work in, or was a uh, big role in, in Skype and then helped in the sale of that. And then did a bunch of other things in, in very big businesses. And he now lives in Portugal. And so I'm like, huh. I'm going to figure out a way to to talk to him and get to know him. And so mm. my strategy is always similar. It's like, how can I introduce myself to him, talk to him, but in a way that will be different to everybody else and in a way that is not like, oh my God, I'm such a fan of your work or how typically I would say that these people get approached. Um, and so I always f look for common ground first. So what you were saying and, you know, the minute that Ali Abdal said he lived in Portugal, I'm like, okay, that's one common ground. Now mm. let me go dig through socials and see what else, like, where does he live? Does he live anywhere near where I could provide value or offer? Like, I saw that he has kids, you know, do I go is my angle about like the schools here in Portugal and did he opt for international, you know, like I will start to look for things where we can strike conversation. Mm. You never want to go in with a pitch, even if you already have an end goal in mind, like, um, unless it's something that there you, the potential of them saying yes is very high. Like if I had a really famous podcast and I wanted him to come on my podcast, maybe in simple email, selling the podcast and doing the pitch would suffice. But since I don't have a simple ask and one that comes with embedded credibility, I need to find other angles. Um, mm. And what the example you, or what you picked up on what uh, of the story I told you about is I always find like, where are we equals and not like me and them. Um, and so like when, when I, like the example I told you is when I landed uh, for a conference in the Philippines where we met and I saw that one of the speakers was uh, getting picked up in the same taxi as, as I am, as I was, I, I thought, okay, like, where's the common, where's something that, where we have common ground? Oh, we both do business with clients in the U S but we're both based out of Europe and Malta and Portugal, you know, so can I start with that? And we just, I started having a conversation and being like, how do you, like, I also, you know, like we're equal. I also live in a country 
less developed economically and you know where not that much happens in our world how do you deal with that do you feel isolated how do you keep relationships and um with with your network in the states and you know immediately we're like sharing a pain point or sharing uh, and similar stories and in this instance where it's like somebody who is a speaker like if you're going to a networking event obviously you know what speakers will be there because it's published. Do you research in advance to find that common ground or do you try to find that just on the spot? Sometimes I could try to find that on the spot, but I'll find that a lot harder. I I don't think I'm very good at making that kind of conversation, you know, talking about the weather and stuff like Yeah. Um, I think my husband would deal much better in that kind of scenario, you know, where he can strike up conversation with strangers and talk about nothing for ages. Um, I prefer to do the research. I think that's um, my personality type, but I would imagine a lot of people hearing this might identify as similar where they prefer, maybe they're more introverted and they prefer to come to conversation a little bit prepared. Yeah, um, for sure. And what's that process look like? That like research prep process? Oh. Well, it's very organic, you know, just <laughs> see where, what you can find about them online and follow a thread of where, like, you're similar. Um, and sometimes it's just as simple as, like, oh, location, okay, deal with that. Or, oh, they mentioned this book, let me talk about that. Mm. Um, with with So how I told you that I could trace everything back to a tweet, it was that Chris... Uh, Ducker was doing an interview selling his book Virtual Freedom and talking about and and I think was also publicizing his virtual staffing agency and he said if you're not a graphic designer don't graphic design leave that to the people who know what they're doing and I remember I just tweeted at him like thank you for sharing that if you're not a graphic designer don't graphic design because you know helps us stay in business you know <laughs> me freelance graphic designer and he saw from my Twitter bio that at the time I was based in London and he was about to come from the Philippines to London to host a one day mastermind. He saw that as a sales opportunity and invited me to to go to attend his mastermind. And I had never been sold to before that way. Like I didn't understand. I thought it was a genuine invite. And but it maybe like I'm sure what there there's genuine aspects to it. He he thought I would benefit and it would be a good fit. But um, he was like, oh, I'm hosting this event. You should come. I had to take a day off work for that. I was still at my nine to five and it was the most money I had ever spent. It was 250 pounds, I think around $300. Um, but he invited me and I was like, okay, sure. Um, and yeah, and that's where he told me about the event in the Philippines, which mm. is where I met Matthew Kimberly. And then it was at a, an event hosted by Matthew Kimberly that um, someone was a student of Chris Doe's community um, and said, you should be a guest on his channel. Let me make the intro. Ah, cool. And so with Chris Doe, it's kind of like I got lucky yeah but you put yourself in the, in the situation yeah. to get the look yeah yeah so, you have to keep putting yourself out there so that opportunities can come your way and so i want to reverse they don't happen when we're yeah. locked and not talking to anyone in our yeah. computers yeah and so i want to try to reverse engineer some of this into a framework uh so you mentioned that it, your process is organic, but I also made a note like that you made that that comment about a book. So if you were to try to just, you don't have to necessarily make it into some process, but if you were to just list off a few examples of things that you'd look out for for common ground, like do you always, it sounds like you don't think it's important that that common ground is business related or even related to your profession or, or anything that is just common ground or general. And maybe Maybe it's even better if it's not business related. I don't know. But you mentioned a book. You mentioned where you live. You mentioned kids. Like, what are some other examples of things you might look for? Would you look for hobbies? Would you look for mutual relationships? Like, list off examples. I'll shut up now. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> all of that. What else? Like, 
Um, definitely mutual contacts. Um, you know, that's my other, that's next on my list of this business coach that I just, I don't, to be honest, I don't even have an end game. I was just like, I like to keep adding people to my list of people who I know. Because mm. if, if, if you want a framework, my framework is first, it's just the more people know about who you are, what you do and for whom, the more likely it is that you'll get referrals coming your way mm. or opportunities. You know, the more people know about who you are and what you're after, the more likely it is that they'll opportunities will come your way. For example, the year I wanted to start speaking, I started in every conversation. I, I made a note to myself, just remember to mention you're looking for speaking gigs. So I would drop mm. it, that into any conversation I had. And that got people introducing me to people. And okay, so if you if we work off that sentence of like the more people know about what who you are, what you do, and for whom, the more likely it is that they'll send people your way. We need to work on our network. And for that, my framework, it's not polished yet. It doesn't have alliteration or whatever yet. I think it did at one point. I just forgot. I just know that the the main thing is, you know, like the three three pillars, you've got alignment. So is who you're you need to keep adding people to your network, but you need to think alignment. Are they aligned with either the type of clients that I want or the mission? You know, there's no point in meeting the top expert in something completely related to what you want to do, right? And so there's alignment. Then you need volume. So you need to keep adding people. It doesn't matter if you just know the one important person. You need more for opportunities to come your way. And then the most important one is depth of the relationship um because sure you can find common ground to strike the first conversation but how do you keep deepening the relationship over the years and how do you keep having multiple conversations and eventually getting invited to things mm. um, and how do you it's hard you <laughs> you just um a really good tool is dex Dex. Dex. With with an X okay. or a C K S. D E X. Yeah. Okay. Get Dex. Oh, com. like roll a Dex. Okay. You put um, the people you want to stay in touch with, and you say how frequently, and I'll just remind mm. you. Reach out to them. Um, Zach, I obviously don't use it. Otherwise, I would have reached out to you sooner. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to like. Because I've always done it organically, and now that I haven't done it proactively because I'm more focused on being a parent, I realized that that has had an impact in business. Because mm. um, before it came naturally, because I was I was going to like eight events a year, and so naturally I kept reaching out to my network, being like, "Are you going to this event?" Da -da -da -da. Like, yeah, and, and it you was see the same people and things like that. Like it just comes up. Yeah, and they introduce you to other people, and or they're you go to a conference, you you meet someone that was there and they'll, they'll be like, hey, come out to lunch with us. We're going, uh, let me introduce you to these other people right. as well. Um, so I do think if anyone's in a position to go to live events, I do think that's the easiest way mm. to form in-depth relationships. Um, because most of the relationships you'll, you'll make you, you can go deeper much quicker at events than if you're relying on like exchanges of comments on social media or zoom calls mm. you know? and that was going to be my question is like if an online only approach is viable or if it's if doing the in-person like it sounds i mean i can at least say for myself that the connections forged in person like it's just really hard to to match that online do you do you think there's a viable online only route or do you think you kind of really need to do some in-person stuff. I do because I've done it. I've had um, relationships with people online who would, it, I didn't meet them in person until like five years later. And mm. one in particular that comes to mind, we ended up working on a lot of projects. Like I guess with um, Delia, right? That was online first. No, no, Laura Hudson. Delia, mm. we met in person right away. I was like, oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I was like, let me fly to Barcelona because it's an hour flight and an excuse to leave the house. Um, but I remember Laura, she was, a. we met through B school. 
we met through commenting on each other's posts on Facebook, and then we hopped on Zoom once, and then we carried on messaging each other. And but it happened effortlessly because I think we had a lot of things in common. And then we started referring clients to each other because I only did design, she only did development. And mm. that kept the relationship alive, right? Because then we had work、sense. things to talk about. And then we'd get on calls to discuss work things. We'd end up talking personal things.、Um, so I do think that it is possible to maintain relationships online only. But if you think about, Zach, we, we went to a four day event. How many hours did we have together? A lot. Yeah. We wouldn't have been able to match that in such a short amount of time online. Yeah. Especially like what I'm thinking about is your your approach for how you would net with like net, network with a speaker or someone who's kind of like further along the path than you. And that one I feel like would be really hard to reproduce online because typically if someone is in that position, they have like so many more social media demands on their time. And if social media is kind of the main place, like how would that even work? I don't know if you have any ideas, but. That one seems like it might be tough online. But it is. But if you're always looking for opportunities to either talk or develop the relationship further, I'm sure they will come.、Mm. Like、um, the example where I, I reached out to Selena Sue. Um, someone who I admired, I was on her newsletter. I reached out to her cold. I said, I, I, I'm about to hand in my notice. Your newsletters have helped me a lot. I want to show my appreciation. She didn't reply, I don't think. Or maybe she replied, very generic reply.、Mm. Another email newsletter she sends out, I reply to her. By the third time I do this, she's like, so thoughtful of you. I'm so happy you're enjoying my newsletters.、Um, What do you do?、Hmm. And I、That's、said,、cool. um, I'm a graphic designer. I just started.、Um, f- f- yeah, if you ever need any graphic design, let me know. And she started asking me about pricing. Who do I work with? Da, da, da. Through that exchange, she also gave me some tips, which I thought was really generous.、Um, but she was also probably understanding, like, well, what does she charge in case I ever need anyone? And because I stayed top of mind, because I kept replying to her newsletters, it happened that one day her designer called in sick on the eve of a launch, and she, I was top of mind.、Mm, and so、cool. she called in, she, she emailed me.、Um, I pulled an all nighter to help her because I had work the next day. So the only extra time I had was at night. <laughs> and I got it done. And that, you know, that furthered the relationship. So then I, Carried on emailing and trying to keep that alive. But then it was when she posted on Facebook that she needed an assistant to help her with a mastermind she was hosting in New York that I volunteered. And I was like, okay, this is my opportunity to really deepen the relationship. Even though it was going to be unpaid, I was going to have to fly myself there, put myself in a hotel there.、Um, to anyone, Out, like looking in, that could be that could seem like, well, that's even to Selena. She was like, Are you sure that doesn't seem like a smart decision? Like, you're gonna <laughs> pay to do volunteer work. And I told her, I was like, Look, no task will be beneath me, I will be super professional, but I know that, but I, I'm, I'm doing this because I know that being around you, I will learn a, a ton. I'm I just want to be around you. You don't even need to give me much time of day, but just witnessing how you do things will help me, I'm sure. And、um, by the end of the week, you know, she was,、uh, you know, it was a really tough week. There was a lot of, we worked from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. By, I was commuted, commuting to Brooklyn for,、uh, to an Airbnb. I ended up, she was like, just stay here, stop commuting, because I need you here at 7 a.m. tomorrow again. So, I just stayed at her house. And, you know, it's like it just got deep really fast, right? Because、yeah. it was in, in, this,、uh, in a situation that, it, how could it not be? You know, I was living through the ups and downs with her of that week. I was helping her as much as I could. And then by the end of the week, she took us out for a spa date and for dinner.、Um, and the last day、uh, that I was meant to work for her, she was like, actually, I'm going to hire. An assistant on TaskRabbit to help me with a party, and you're going to come as my guest.、Mm. 
And so I came to her business anniversary party as her guest. And that's where I got introduced to Lewis House and Derek Halpern and Ramit Sethi and Jim Quick. Um, yeah, so many people who then became clients as well. Yeah, and I think that's like a classic example of you kind of taking a bit of a risk, but taking it in a calculated way where you are putting yourself into what could be a really lucrative situation in terms of you leveling up, getting good connections, things like that. Like you were essentially getting into the thick of the day-to-day -day life of a dream client. I thought that was quite cool. Yeah. So for those of you guys who are live here, so Bruce and Thomas, if you guys have any questions you want to put into the chat on this networking topic before we go, or before we move on rather, uh, I'm going to ask a couple. So as I'm reflecting on all the stuff that you've said so far, Joanna, and I'm thinking about that question of, okay, so how do I approach somebody at an event without the celebrity fan dynamic, without being salesy, but also selling myself? It sounds like the answer is like, you maybe don't sell yourself in air quotes. Like, what's the what's the transition from connecting with, so let's say, Matthew Kimberly, you're talking about the Malta thing. You're talking about the common ground. What's the transition from that to talking about yourself? Is it just you wait to be asked, basically? Or what's your like yeah. flow like? No, definitely I wait to be asked. Inevitably, if you get into a genuine conversation, they people will want to know a little bit about you too. Yeah. Right? They'll think, oh, Zach, like you've, you've just been helping me so much with, with this. Well, what about you? Where are you from? What do you do? Yeah, makes sense. So it's kind of like, it sounds like it's less about going into it, trying to get something out of it and more about like the, the theme that I'm seeing everywhere is just, it's about building relationships and yeah. that's kind of, that's it. So just any opportunity to make more connections, build more relationships, sort yeah. it. It's what I imagine. I mean, I met my husband really young, but it's what I would imagine dating is like, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't go in and, and find someone's profile and, and ask them to, to marry them, you know, or go on a date right away you, you have conversations and and you don't you also don't show up to the date and be like okay so here's why you should marry me i am uh, this 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 these are my flaws what do you think are you in <laughs> um you know so it's it's very organic and and i don't i don't even see them being a client as the end result because if you think back to like the more people know about who you are, what you do, and for whom, the more likely it is they'll they'll bring work your way. Then it's really just about expanding your network. It's about like, okay, well, can they introduce me to other people too? Is there like what's the because obviously if you are making the connection and you're missing some of those those pillars you shared earlier, like then you might build a network, but not necessarily in a way that moves you in the direction you want to go. Like if you were to build a, let's almost say like a weekly relationship building practice, is it like what amount of time would you spend each week and what kinds of things would you do? Would you be just like reaching out to people who would be potential clients, would have connections with potential clients, be peers? Like what type of, if you were to be strategic, who would you be building relationships with? Uh, well, me right now, or because I know if I had some extra time right now, I would probably like, here's what I would love to do. I would love to like every day for an hour, take myself to a nice cafe where I feel inspired. Maybe go through like some past pictures, some past Instagram posts and think like, oh yeah, at Tropical Think Tank, I met this person. I met Zach. I haven't reached out to him in a while. Mm. I would probably see from socials, what you're doing and i write as thoughtful of an email as i could being like hey zach um how have you been since you were last in portugal um you know like i saw that you've been up to this this and this how is it you know like i would old school letter style right if you had a pen pal that's what i would do um and i would just reach out to past clients, find how their website is doing, what offerings they're, how things have changed. And I would just write thoughtful, longish emails. So you would prioritize, if you were spending, let's say, 
you said an hour a day, right? Like, so let's say you were just spending an I hour have a day. A lot of people too that I want to get reconnected <laughs> with. <laughs> I think the pandemic plus kids, just I'm out of touch with everyone. So right now, I feel like I could do with an hour a day. Yeah. So you, if you were to spend that time, so you think for anyone, probably that time would be better spent reconnecting with people they already know who might be in the kind of direction they're wanting to go versus prioritizing new relationships. So it sounds like you go nurture more so than get new ones. I think nurture, that's what I would go nurture now because um, I think with nurture, I could also get new relationships. Mm. Um, Makes sense because they connect you with you know, people exactly. and then you get that there's a yeah. lot of people that you could introduce me to and there's a lot of people I could introduce you to. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess you it's know, better so to why not build a spend some time talking about seeing what synergies we have in our networks and who could we benefit from knowing. Because if you introduce me to someone who trusts you, they're going to be a lot more likely to give me time of day than if I cold pitch myself to them. Totally. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think the same thing. And uh, by by like leveraging that, like you're chatting, you're like, oh, that's cool. Who did, who'd you learn? Or if I'm just like, hey, Joanna, you should talk to blank person. Like, yeah, you're, you're starting from, it kind of has you starting from equal footing because now this other person is making the intro and it's not like you asking this person for their time, this third party saying you guys should chat because I think you'd both find each other interesting. Very cool. I like that. Yeah. And like you could, I, I've had people make really thoughtful intros into like describing like okay so here's joanna this is what she does she in a recent conversation she mentioned this i immediately thought of you because you did that and here's where i thought you um here's some topics that i thought you could talk about if you chatted and joanna this here's this person this is what they do da, 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 da. and that has made for really interesting first conversations with people mm. Um, yeah, and if you're the one who makes the intro, then you get like brownie points for being the matchmaker as well. It's also a good way to stay top of mind passively because then every time those two people will connect, they'll remember who you are, and what you're doing for whom. <laughs> so suppose I'm just a freelancer, right? Like let's say that I am a web developer. I don't have too many... I don't really have too many contacts in my target market. Like I know kind of who I want to do websites for, but I have done like one client, maybe. Let's say I haven't even done a client, a client project in this niche yet. And I don't really have any contacts in the niche. And I'm like friends with some other web developers, but they're just like web developers who do generalized work or are staff members. Like, what do you think the first step for me is? Is it going to an event that the people in my target audience are going to go to? And I just like try to build authentic relationships. Is it talking to my other developer connections? Like, what do you think my first step should be? Oh, I think going to an event is a great first step. Um, but of course, it's hard to know which events. But if you could find one that is mid-sized, so it's not too big that you get overwhelmed and lost by not knowing anybody. You know, I think tropical think tank had 50 people. I think that was a great size. And the fact that we were there for three days, it really allowed everybody to know who everyone was by the end of the day. I'm pretty sure, Zach, we could both name everybody that was there the year we were there yeah. for the years. Um, and so that would be a great way to to start. Um, if you didn't want to go to events just yet, I would also recommend uh, building strategic partnerships. So who serves your ideal clients with complementary services to you? Um, if you're a developer, make friends with designers, photographers, copywriters, business coaches, um, and start that way rather than cold pitching your services to your potential mm. clients. Um, can you join a Facebook group or Discord community uh, where your potential clients are hanging out and just provide a lot of value. Like I remember, I think 100 of my first clients came from the B school Facebook group, an online mm. course that I was a part of. And when it came to the module of launch your website, cause it's a, a course online course all about how to launch your online business. So there was a module all about 
launching your website. And even though in it, they taught how to do it yourself, a lot of people were like, I don't have time to figure this out. Who here can help me? And so that week, I was just answering everybody's comments. I was just Mm. helping out. I was jumping on free calls, helping. Um, And that suddenly I became the person, the go-to person if you wanted a website. And I started to get a lot of business from that, from that status that I got just from being helpful and adding value to people. Something I find interesting about all the things that seem to have worked well for you is that it seems like quite often the things that have turned out well have been uh, a consequence of a financial investment on your part. Like you joined B-School, very expensive course, Tropical Think Tank, quite an expensive event. Like you're going to paid events or you flew yourself out to do this sort of like self-driven internship with that woman. Like I think that there is probably something to be said for being being in communities where there is a bit of a barrier to entry where people are taking things more seriously or something like that i don't know what thoughts you have on that thread yeah a lot of people don't like to hear like oh pay to be in the room (laughs) and pay to get access but that's how i got to where i'm now and i think if Mm. now i wanted to drastically change the level of clients that i serve a fastest way would probably be to pay for another Mm. event where I could find these people. Um, I've bartered my way into events before. Um, There was a, an event that was 10 K for two days. And I'm like, I don't, I can't do this. Mm. But I asked the host, like, is there anything I can do in exchange? I'd really love to do it. And we did, and I, uh, we bartered. And I got to go to the event and I got to be in the room and have lunch with people I otherwise don't think I would have. Nice. Even if I I had implemented all my best tactics of networking, because they are just that many steps ahead. You know, like Mm. even if I'm, I don't think I could ever get in, I could never get Oprah to talk to me. I don't At least not with yet. all of my, you know, like just so many steps ahead. I could possibly pay to get in the room with her. Yeah. It's probably also very expensive, <laughs> you know, but it's, you have to also understand where you're at and the level of people you can network with. with. I think 10 years, now 10 years, um, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have as easily been able to get access to people that maybe now it's a little bit easier yeah. because I can just name drop or I could ask for the intro directly. So I I have a couple things I want to circle back on. Uh, So one of them is that starting of the network and the other one is the strategic partnership. So again, supposing I'm a developer and I don't have a lot of clients or clout, can't name drop anybody. Does the first step of starting a network look like finding, finding like a design agency building that relationship or because because that's the thing that I'm trying to reverse engineer about about your situation that's kind of unique here is that with you uh doing networking with like bigger internet marketers and stuff that works because your clients are internet marketers but I'm trying to imagine like if I'm a developer who serves like I don't know like industrial manufacturers or something <clears throat> where it's less of a maybe this is an assumption I'm making but where it's like less of a networking y kind of crowd. I'm wondering what that looks like. There are events for everything. So you'd go to the industrial manufacturers of Portugal event and just chat with people and like build personal connections. And that's how you'd approach it. Yeah. And for... and I would if if it was if now you told me like, okay, go go get clients in that industry. And I'm like, okay, well, I know nothing about that industry. I would look at who do I know and I would start asking around and um and it could be like oh my dad has a friend who is in this industry and I could be like dad could you ask them like if there's any podcast they listen to or an Mm. event that they go to and I would I would use that as a starting point maybe I'd go to the event and I'd I'd just be curious you need to like immerse yourself in their world learn their language learn their pain points um 
and see where, yeah, just see where you can find common ground again and see where you can add value. But I wouldn't go in booth to booth and pitch myself. Right. I'd be like, oh, it's so cool. Like, so how long have you been in business? You know, ask a lot of questions. And then if you can ask, like, what, um, how did you learn how to grow your business to this point? And, mm. and see what else you can, yeah, I don't know. I just ask a lot of questions until they ask you what you do. <laughs> And if you were to do, like, let's say you were to try to build a strategic partnership with an agency. So let's say you wanted to approach a web development agency or something. What's your approach usually look like if you're cold outreaching, not with someone you met at an event? Like, what, what's your kind of cold outreach approach look like? Well, I actually have an email template that's like... I Is think that the Delia... one Delia mentioned? Yeah. Okay, yeah. give us the link for that. Sure. So, so you can, like, just swipe that email. But um, basically... If you want, well, my technique would be like to start with making the email really personal so that they know it's not a generic pitch to all the agencies out there. So do your research, spend time. It's worth investing. It's better like to send five of these emails where you've taken the time and research than 500 of generic emails that right. are clearly a template. You won't get a reply that way or not likely. And then you want to compliment the agency you're reaching out to as well so that immediately when they're reading, they don't know what the email is about yet, but they already want to read the next line because you made them feel good. So you like say some project they did well or something about their positioning or what kind of compliment? Yeah, pick up on something that's not generic again. So pick up mm. on like, oh, I saw that, you know, for, for GIF, what I would pick up on is like if you had seen said something like oh just congratulations on turning eight i saw the series mm. of posts you did recently particularly lo loved the eight books or the eight I, I forgot like what already went out on socials but you know and and that would that would be like oh that's nice to hear you know i'm glad that someone's reading our social media or that the book post was helpful to someone you know so so now the person reading it is feeling good and is reading the next line and already like is trusting the person sending the email a little bit more because you can tell that they've been thoughtful with their outreach and they've spent some time and it hasn't just been blasted out yeah. and they actually want to reach you personally and also make sure the email is addressed to the right person because it's not that hard to find out who works at gift design studios and when they once we get an email that says like dear um, sir or madam yeah i'm like to really, your webmaster to whom this may concern like yeah you can find out to whom it concerns exactly like it's not hard yeah. um and yeah and then like try and keep your pitch as succinct as possible you know delia was like i don't know if you need a extra pair of hands for your projects and then give them all the relevant information delia mentioned she's happy working behind the scenes white labeling or dealing directly uh, front and center with the clients that's relevant information she mentioned like the type of clients she worked with uh, she had a testimonial and she had other links to previous works and other things i could check out to further um understand if i wanted to talk to her or not can you hear these thunders that are happening yes yeah. sounds very ominous all right continue sorry i just had to call attention <laughs> that's to it thunder that's thunder explosive wow. thunder so if I just disappear, it's because the internet went. Um, continue. <laughs> Sorry to throw you off. Um, no, but yeah, and it just that's the email. And then you just end with a clear call to action. Okay. Maybe it's, do you want to meet on Zoom for 20 minutes? Hmm. Um, now, a lot of people have sent me that exact email. I have swiped my template because I talk <laughs> about it a lot. We have, I have so many versions of this of my template used on me it's <laughs> hilarious um but i've actually only taken two meetings mm. and so then I, I think it's relevant to share this because then it's not just about the email i took these two meetings because the two agencies that were pitching me their portfolio was really strong mm. and so i really think that we could collaborate with and one of them was because they they serve clients that I want to serve too. Mm. 
um, or we serve very similar clients and I serve clients that they want to serve. So there's like, yeah, they're a video it... marketing agency. So yeah. like, for me, I was like, okay, no brainer. I want to meet with you. And okay, I want to meet with you. This is because I'm at a point where I'm not as open as I once was to take meetings to everybody. So also take that into account into who you're targeting. You'll be more likely to get more meetings with people at similar levels. That makes sense. And I also at a place where they're just starting out, they still need yeah. to grow the network. Yeah. And I like your point about the meetings you did take because that's that's a really good thing to keep in mind is if you're reaching out to an agency like be thinking about what do they get out of it? Why why would they want to work with me versus some other web developer? And trying to be sure to have that deal be sweetened because, you know, not everyone's going to have the target clients that you would want, but there might be something else that they could mention. This is cool. Yeah. I'm going to so it's not trend... just about the email, you know, like some people yeah. are like, I sent your email, it didn't work. I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, alignment, that's the one of the pillars. Like there needs to be alignment there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean the portfolio quality, I think that goes a really long way. Like somebody could have the best copywritten email in the world, but if you go and look at their work and it's just not that strong, you're not gonna want to send your clients to them. Or if you like I think about myself, I've I've never found an SEO partner to refer my web design clients to who I felt just really confident they knew their shit. After all the time in business, I just never found one. And so, you know, if someone sends me a really, really good email, but then I go to their website and they don't have any testimonials or they don't have any past clients or they don't have something that makes me believe that this person really, really knows what they're doing, I'm I'm obviously not going to pursue that even if the email is really, really good. So I think that's a good point. So if anyone in the chat has questions on the networking thing, ask them now. But I'm going to transition now, Joanna, into talking a little bit about your different um, like business models that you've had over the years. Is there anything before we transition that you want to mention on this networking thread? Like any final thoughts or like limiting belief systems you had to move past or just miscellaneous closing notes on the networking piece? Just know it's it's a slow game. Be patient. Mm. Um, if that if this becomes a strategy now to get clients, just know that some of the fruits you will only collect after a year. So just plant the seeds, keep watering them. You will collect fruits. It just takes some time. Yeah, I love that. What do you reckon a good like early early feedback mechanism is? that shows you're kind of on the right track instead of using the KPI as like getting clients. Is I don't it just think that there you is talk to people. I don't okay. think I don't think there is one because like for example, like I met someone at an event seven years ago. We've stayed in touch. And only now that they've quit where they were mm. and started on their own, did they start sending me clients. Like I mm. didn't know. I didn't know that was gonna happen, you know, like Makes sense. But, it's a, yeah. I guess, about being in the game long enough to be able to see the fruits grow. But you know, the feedback mechanisms, like you know, the it's going well if if you feel that every interaction you have with that person is a little bit more meaningful, mm. and if you're able to keep it uh, consistent without it always feeling forced and without you always initiating. Okay. That's good. I like that as a a KPI. So with your business, uh you were you working as a designer, like an employed designer before you quit, or what what was your day job before? Yes. I was employed at a design agency. And then you quit that and you went straight from that into your like self led internship for that woman whose name I forgot, or what was that transition period like? Um, well, I so I, I took B school and then I was doing B school on the side of my job and taking mm. a lot of clients from B school. And it just very quickly, I very quickly grew a wait list of six months, and that gave me enough safety to quit my job. And so okay. I just went full on freelancing full time. Okay, cool. And so you basically you built enough freelance revenue that it outweighed your job revenue and then quit the job. Yeah. 
from but that was from day one yeah okay and so how long were you a solo freelancer before you started scaling <laughs> um so i think timeline wise it was like i graduate in may start working in july um multiple internships first free t a full-time job in september by february i enroll in b school march i start making i start matching my salary i wow. quit in may so it wasn't that long um so i really was only at my full-time job from september to till may it was, wasn't even a full year um and then in June, I move here. In July, we have our first full-time employee. August, we have our second. October, we move into our offices. Wow, I hadn't realized it so fast. So what year is this that we're talking about? 2014. Okay, so May of 2014, you worked with your first client in B-School? I'm just, I'm trying to no, lay out March. this timeline. Away. March 2014, I start working with my first clients. And then... By May, May you I quit. quit your job. Okay. Yeah, because March, like I, I had to give in um, these numbers for an article I wrote on Business Insider, and March I made four k. Was my first month freelancing. Um, and I made four k selling nine hundred dollar brand name entities. I was just working a lot, fueled by adrenaline, and I was twenty two, so it was like easy to go on no sleep. Um. And then April, I do a little bit more. By May, I'm already doing like 7K months, 8K months. That's why I'm able to then fly myself to New York. Um, and then when did you say you got your first staff member? July. And your first staff member was a designer, I guess? Yeah. I'm just writing this down because I know I'll lose track of it. July, first hire. And then what was the next mile? You rounded off like 20 milestones that happened within a short window. What was the next milestone? Yeah, I think July? it was then the second designer right away. It was either August or September. And then in October, we moved in to our offices where we still are today. And so you move, you got a brick and mortar office when you had just you and your husband and two designers. Yeah. Okay. And then... At that point, I guess you were doing probably still mostly just referral work from within the B school connections, or where was your yes. work coming from at that point? No, well, I think in the timeline by then we had already gone to Tropical Think Tank. Oh no, no, Tropical Think Tank was 2015. I don't know. I have to revisit. I think it was the 2015. So then, yeah. so then it was probably um, it was probably B school and uh, the clients from Selena. Because Selena, okay. the free internship was in May of that year. And so when you think of how you scaled originally, like when you hired those initial designers, like this, because this is us kind of segueing into the start the right type of business course. Yeah. I know that it was your desire for maternity leave that kind of catalyzed creating a business that you could step away from. I'm curious, when you were first hiring, did you make Looking back, did you make any gigantic mistakes that were like really costly or wasted a bunch of money or like did it kind of go smoothly when you did your first hires? I made a lot of mistakes. I don't think any of them were gigantic in the sense that they all taught me how to run the business better. So I've, I learned from every single mistake what I think was happening. And if I were to now go back in time and kind of coach my 22 year old self is um <laughs> to slow down a little bit mm. i think i would have said that because i was just like zach i was going a million miles an hour i was just like non-stop always on always looking on I, I had so much fomo i was like let me always be on on the facebook group seeing what's happening replying to everything catching every opportunity jumping on calls right away when someone showed interest i was just working from the moment i woke up to the moment i went to bed at night mm. but i was excited because it was new and i was like suddenly the sky was the limit i was 
listening to all these podcasts of all these success stories and I was like yes this is this is going to be me in a couple of years and oh my gosh like I can do anything everything's going well I was just saying yes to everything and I was just following like what was what kept happening to me you know so when I was with Selena she was like raise your price I'm like yeah okay got it Mm. what's next well uh if you want to take on more projects well you need to hire I'm like great so what do I need to do to hire well you need to write a job ad great how do I write a job ad (laughs) you know and it was just sort of like I was never thinking of the repercussions you know like I lived in London at the time when I started my business it was and and our first hire which didn't work out we just tested it out um freelancing wise he was in Scotland it was really expensive. And so it was my husband was like, okay, well, if it's your dream eventually to run a design agency, because that's what I saw my boss do, right? So I didn't even know what other business there were was to start. Yeah. That, that's the first thing. Like before B-School, I wasn't aware that I could even have a business. It wasn't something I thought about. Mm. It just wasn't in my awareness. I read design books. I consumed design things. It wasn't until... I didn't even know how it came across on YouTube that I was like, oh, I could do this. And then when it came to like, okay, I could be an entrepreneur, that was there wasn't even the question of what business to start because it just felt like that was the only one I could start. Makes sense. It was if and it was so, all you had been exposed to. Yeah. It was all I yeah. And so I I never I I never questioned myself, like, do I want this? What will this imply in a couple of years time? Will I enjoy the ride? How big do I want to grow? Like, I didn't know. It was just like, yes, yes, yes. I was just following the excitement and the next thing to grow. Mm. Um, and for the first year, it was good. I didn't burn out in the first year. Everything was exciting. And then it was from then that I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What just mm. happened? Oh, because I, I didn't finish the thought. But it was my husband who was actually like, well, well if you're going to hire why don't we move back to Portugal? Um, and I was like, that feels exciting. Yes. Where to? Lisbon or Porto? I'm from Lisbon. He's from Porto. And I was like, oh, Porto. Because I think um, I my dad has some offices available for rent. Like, I didn't know at the time I was making the decision of where I'm going to raise my kids. <laughs> Yeah. I had yeah, no you just idea. kind of followed the the next step. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I thought, well, you know, who knows? Maybe next year we'll be heading up offices in New York and maybe, you know, it just everything seemed so I was 22, everything was a possibility. And so I was just saying yes to things that felt fun mm. without understanding the repercussions. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I to be fair, I think it's probably pretty normal like you you get exposed to something new, you start to have some early success, and it's easier to get like really pumped and caught up. And then you look back after this like wild ride, and you're like, oh, wow, this has been very intense. So when you were first scaling your business, like I'm thinking back to the conversation we had a few years ago versus the business you have now. So like, if you think about what we could call your, I don't know, crappy before state agency, the one that was feeling very draining, not very profitable, you had a lot of staff, you had a lot of revenue, but you had a lot of costs. And, and you compare that to the current present day agency. Like if someone's listening to this and they're trying to decide, do I want to grow an agency? The thing that I think is interesting about you is that it, it goes to show you can't make some blanket statement that says yes or no, because all agencies of this type and size and variety are going to be this way because you took essentially the same agency with a little bit of staff changes and turned it from something that was draining and not very profitable into something that you described as like the dream business and profitable. So what do you think the, um, if you were to just compare those two experiences, what are like your top top lessons to to say to somebody or what are the things that you didn't like about the old one? How do you change them? Like, I guess what's your just broad wisdom on this whole make an agency not suck theme? So the agency sucked because I I think I was I was treating my clients like bosses. Didn't have very good boundaries. I was operating on very low profit margins, which meant that I needed to always be fully booked. 
that put a lot of mm. stress on myself. Um, because I was operating on low profit margins, I also still needed to wear a lot of hats between creative director and sales, and I needed to close a lot more sales than I need to now at our new prices. And and yeah, like growing revenue at the time meant more people and more people to manage. Like there come, I think someone, I've heard people say different numbers, but you should never manage more than five people or seven people. And then if you have more than that in the team, they should be managed by other people and you manage the managers. Mm. I was managing 10 people and that's where everything started breaking. Um, and then when team members started not getting along, I started to have to be the HR person and being the mitigator in these conversations. And it was just sucking up all of the time, which I didn't have because all of my time needed to be in biz dev and sales. And, and you know, it's just the foundations were badly built. And so now we prioritize profit and the well-being of the team. And I think prioritizing profit is understanding who you serve and what's the offer exactly, or a couple of offerings. At the beginning, we we're saying yes to every industry, to every, we were creating websites on Squarespace, on WordPress and Shopify, whatever people asked us, we did. Um, which mm. meant that with every project we were like starting from zero and doing different processes and learning again. And, and I had the attitude of like, okay, but we can figure this out. We just can't say no to these opportunities because that's, they'll keep us from growing. But I didn't understand that saying yes to these opportunities could also keep us from growing because they could, yeah. they kept us from doubling down on the things we were good at and and streamlining our processes for like now we focused on like okay we only build on wordpress um because we found that's the thing people asked us most about and so we're like okay well that's going to be our focus um we don't do iphone apps anymore and we don't do web apps anymore which we used to but they're a completely different game um we we focused on we doubled down on serving these like personality brands and experts and coaches and own like that was a niche that I accidentally fell into because of b-school it wasn't mm. on purpose um and then we also try to do e-commerce and we do a little bit of e-commerce for brand identity and packaging design um yeah and, and then just understand like you know the you you asked me to track my time that's something i did a lot of at the beginning i haven't done that exercise recently but there is i i do recognize there's so much benefit in doing that and understanding like okay well and also out of this what does my ideal week look like what do i what do i find draining in business and you know like you said like don't just manage your time also manage uh, measure your energy um and so i started delegating the things that I also didn't like and and yeah just started to learn how to build a business that's a lot kinder to me and that pays me more mm. me and, and my team and so it sounds like for the prioritizing profit i just want to make sure i'm clear you were saying that the one of the biggest steps for, for being kind of profit oriented was having a honed service offering like you found your profitability through a consistent service offering is that right yeah and so I'm curious, it, is it only that or was it also raising the prices on that? Also raising the prices on that. Okay. So but what it, do you it, think? It comes hand in hand, right? Like the minute you realize what's the core offering, you can also get better at it and get more efficient yeah. at it, which raises the profitability. And then if you raise the profitability, you can also invest maybe in better staff, which then raises the quality, which then allows mm. you to raise the price or... Yeah spend That's more time smart. networking to raise the profiles of your clients so it's not like there wasn't a aha moment and suddenly we doubled our prices you know it's all very slowly mm. um, just incremental changes 
So I have a few questions on this, but I see that we're at the time we scheduled for. Do you have a couple minutes to go over? Or should I try to wrap this up in 30 seconds? No, a couple minutes. Okay. So um, I'm curious what you think a good targeted markup is on staff hours. So in other words, if your project takes 100 hours to fulfill and your staff costs you on average $30 an hour, like what is the minimum that you should be charging for that project? So let me put it another way. <laughs> Let's say a project takes one hour to fulfill magically and it uh, costs you 30 bucks. What's like your staff markup minimum with your profitability first kind of angle? But I don't really. So if we look at the profit first uh, staff that represents the delivery of the work, I think should be kept at 35% or 40. So you're saying if it takes an hour for your staff to do, you would charge $40 for this project that you're going to have to pay 30 bucks for. No, no. It should be 35. So you charge it should be 35%. So, okay, cool. That makes a lot more sense. I was yeah. concerned for a second. Okay, so you said should essentially aim for like a 3x markup on staff costs at a minimum. Yeah. Though I okay. don't I don't base myself on staff costs. I base myself on like what's the cost I do operations costs. And maybe this isn't the right way to measure things, but I do like how much does it take me to run how um how much does it cost to run the business at the moment? per hour and divide that by the amount of people delivering work. So I don't include myself or my project manager, just like the designers and my husband. And that will give me an idea. But I also calculate based on a 28 hour work week and not a 40 hour work week. Okay. We're being very conservative in our calculations, but I know that they don't work 40 hours billable. Um, right. I would estimate it's more around 30. Okay. Um, if we minus team meetings and breaks and fires that need to put out and all of that. And so what I'll do is like our costs divided by 30 hours divided by five, the people delivering the work. And so that will give me around, I think it's like, I don't know. I'm not going to do the math, but I think around 50 hour, fifty euros an hour, that's how much it costs me to keep running things as mm -hmm. they are. Um, and so I know anything on top of that is profit. Okay. Um, and the moment... This is a good framework. Yeah, we just try and like double it and see what we can do because we know that a lot often we also like the buffer to like the client asks for an extra revision that goes beyond the hours okay we'll do that as a favor because that adds to the client experience we'll mm. make for, we'll make sure that they know that we're giving it for free but we're using this buffer to give them a good experience right you're planning on that in advance that's cool yeah um guys if if you want to type in any questions for joanna before we go type them now i'm I'm just kind of curious. The last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up is but when on you were that, honing... so Zach, on, on that last yeah. thought, just yeah. be very conservative with your calculations. Because I used to be like, wait, but 40 hours a week times X amount of designers, we should already be making 100K per month. Why aren't we? Because mm. it isn't so black and white. Yeah. And, and so like I learned to be extra, extra conservative. And fires will need to put out. Things won't go as planned. And um, yeah, yeah. Same like, assume everything that. will take twice as long and pay twice. half as much, kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. With you honing your service offering, like, was there some level of intentionality there, or was it more reactive? Like, you just noticed a lot of your clients did this. This is the work that you like doing the best, that you do the best job of. Maybe that's closest to the money. Although I don't know if it was. Like, how did you arrive at a honed service offering? And was it intentional or reactive? That's the core question. So getting into brand identity design was intentional. It's what I loved doing. And uh, and then over time, it, we just improved that process. And mm. the good, th what I like about brand identity is that it can be the same process and the same skills for any industry. 
website design was a little bit more reactive. It was like, oh, people do prefer WordPress. Okay, let's learn WordPress. Because nobody's asking us, like even right now, it'd be so much easier if we delivered websites in Webflow. Because then I could mm. have my team build them too. But no one's asking for Webflow. Webflow is still pretty new, I think, to anyone outside the design community. And so they don't trust it. And so they want WordPress. Mm. And so it's been reactive in that way. And it's been reactive in the sense that we fell into like the digital marketer space with the long form sales pages. I had never done a long form sales page at my agency. We didn't have these types of clients. Um, and so that was reactive. But then there have been things that I've tried to be proactive about. Like I, the minute I realized that I was getting a little bit bored of these personality brands and this online space, I, I was like, well, what would, if I was to be internet intentional about it, what would it be? And I was like, well, I would love to design a makeup brand or a skincare brand or something that would be tangible, tangible and I could see on shelves. And, and so I started asking my network, who do I know that owns a mm. skincare brand? Who did you learn from? And through asking these questions, I got introduced to someone who ran a, a Facebook group of 800 estheticians and he taught estheticians hmm. how to launch their own skincare brand. Wow. And so through that, I spoke to that group about the benefits of a good um, visual identity and packaging design. We got three clients from that. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. It's nice to hear that story. And again, seeing that like network thing finding its way into what works well for you. So um, for anyone listening who wants to hear more about the, I, I kind of intentionally asked certain things based on what I know Joanna has been interviewed about before. If you listened to this and you wished you had more detail about how she was able to take the maternity leave where the business kind of hummed along without her, the interview to look up is the one that she did on the future, which doesn't have an E at the end. But so if you're to Google like Joanna Galvão, uh, the future without an E, and the A has the little squiggly Portuguese thingy over it. Uh, you can find where she talks about that. It's really great. She talks about all the processes she put in place. Uh, Joanna, if people want to learn more about you, where should they go? What should they go download or sign up for or whatever? Um, so you go to theambitiouscreatives.com forward slash email scripts if you want to grab the, the email templates that I spoke about. Um, or if you just want to say hi, find me on Instagram at Joanna Galvan Design. Cool. And one more time, what was that link? The email scripts one? Yeah. Theambitiouscreatives.com forward slash email scripts. Cool. Is there anything in this interview that like any questions you wish that I asked or anything else you want to add before we go? Um, no, I think, well, I want to add that I'm very grateful for another conversation with you, Zach. I always love our conversations. And you managed to get me saying things that I haven't before in interviews. So I think that's really good too. I hope that this has been um, useful or inspirational to everyone listening. Yeah, I think it's been awesome. It's been really cool to see like this living case study of of the networking thing. Like, I think even though I seem like an extrovert, I do not really gravitate toward networking. I feel like I don't really know how to do it. And this gives me some ideas for how I could do a networking. So that's great. So thank you so much you for being here. You have a great excuse, right? You can bring people in as guests to the community. and Yeah, this is nice. To, I like it this way. Deep really fast. Yeah. But I'll have to practice for in person if I'm talking to somebody. Anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for being here. Joanna, I will pause the I'll stop the recording. So we'll be here. Everybody else will be gone. Thanks guys for joining us. This has been great. And again, it's the ambitiouscreatives.com slash email scripts, I think it was. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Joanna. This was really, really awesome. I think people are going to get some great insights from this. And I will now hit stop recording. Bye, guys. Bye.